workers in Egypt excavated an ancient Christian tomb in 1945 and discovered a large jar with 48 different works inside that contained 13 leather scroll manuscripts. Later known as the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library, the Gospel of Thomas, however, stood out because it presented a very different interpretation of Jesus' teachings. If all books and teachings weren't contained in the Bible, what would happen? Who made the decision regarding what is retained and what is eliminated? Bishops and Constantine at the Nicene Council in 325 AD. At least 45 books either disappeared entirely or underwent extensive editing. What was left to the populace was what we now refer to as the New Testament, which constitutes Christian theology. In essence, it was diluted, intended for common understanding. As an illustration, they took out a lot of the story of women. The reason many have never even heard of Mary or her tale? Mary's Gospel, which was completely cut out, reveals that her mother was 81 year old, and she was 14 when she was given to Joseph, and a lot more. But in this video I will talk about another important Gospel, the Gospel of Thomas, and point out why it was utterly removed from the Bible. The Gospel of Thomas is an early Christian Gospel that collects 114 of Jesus' proverbs and parables into a short list. It says very little about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and lacks any narrative structure. It is frequently referred to as a sayings gospel and contrasted with the lost sayings collection that Matthew and Luke's authors are thought to have drawn from. By reflecting on the sayings in the gospel, the reader is urged to work toward a deeper understanding of oneself, and the opening sayings of the Gospel of Thomas make the promise that doing so will result in immortality. Nearly half of Thomas's quotes can also be found in Mark, Matthew, and Luke's synoptic Gospels, frequently in very straightforward and unburdened forms. However, other passages in the Gospel assert a robust interpretive framework that shares a great deal of similarity with other early Jewish wisdom theologians, particularly those inclined toward Plato, like Philo of Alexandria. There is only one complete copy of this Gospel, a Coptic translation that can be found in the Nag Hammadi Library's Codex II, a collection of early Christian writings that was unearthed not far from the present-day Upper Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi. However, three Greek fragments also remain from the renowned papyrological finds made at Oxyrhynchus by Grenfell and Hunt. The world is not generally seen in a very positive light in the Gospel of Thomas. The visible world is not the actual world that matters. Only the Spirit can see that world, so if you don't give up the world, you won't find the kingdom. The statement made by John in John 15 verse 18 that if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you, can be compared to what is said here. Therefore, our existence here is only transitory. One day, we will all depart for a more favorable location. Jesus shared his heavenly knowledge while he was on this planet, but his ultimate goal was to return to his heavenly home. Thomas is not the comforter. People are capable of solving problems on their own. This worldview, which holds that the world is hostile, people are oppressed there, and that a heavenly Redeemer will free all who adhere to his teachings, is the basis of Gnosticism, is also prevalent in most religious thought. Consider the tenets of Buddhism, asceticism, mystical philosophy, Kabbalah, etc. At least one aspect of early Christianity was working on this as evidenced by the Gospel of Thomas. Salvation is already here. It doesn't happen at the very end. The kingdom is both within and without you. Thomas asserts that salvation is linked to understanding the meaning of Jesus' words, not to Jesus' death and resurrection. We are not saved by Jesus. We are saved by imitating Jesus. To achieve this, Jesus is our spiritual leader. When we fully comprehend his teachings, we will have eternal life. This will not be a simple task, though. It will demand constant effort. But those who succeed in this endeavor will rule over all. People will realize they are the children of the living Father when they are aware of themselves. There is nothing concealed that will remain a secret. And since God already has all of the information, fasting, as well as prayer, charity, and circumcision in section 14 and section 53 is not necessary. 
Jesus is attempting to shift his followers' attention from their outward religiosity to what is going on inside of them through these sayings. These stones will be useful to you if you become my followers. What you have will save you if you allow it to come out. What you don't have inside of you will kill you if you don't have that. Jesus seems to be implying that full spiritual expression is a prerequisite for salvation in this passage. Those who have heard the word of the Father and have really kept it are blessed. Whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become that person, and the secrets will be made known to that person, the Bible says. What the kingdom of God is like is depicted in a number of allegories. The Synoptic Gospels also contain the majority of the allegories. The kingdom is like a mustard seed, a good seed, a merchant who found a priceless pearl and spent everything he owned to buy it a woman who hid yeast in dough and produced many loaves of bread, a shepherd who lost one of his ninety-nine sheep and left the other ninety-nine to find it, and more. Three allegories, though, are missing from the Synoptic Gospels. The kingdom is like a man who wanted to kill a powerful person, so he thrust his sword into the wall. The kingdom is like a person who didn't know he had treasure in his field and sold it to someone else. It's like a woman carrying a jar full of meal who didn't notice the crack in the jar, so it all spilled while she carried the jar home. The message conveyed in these passages is not always obvious. The sower, the wedding feast, and the wicked tenants are among the parables. The Sermon on the Mount contains numerous quotations. He responded that James the Just, Jesus' brother, would lead them after he was gone. There are also a few passages on sexuality, and that of women that are extremely cryptic. Mary poses a query to Jesus, which suggests that she is a follower of Jesus. Peter goes on to say, Mary should leave us, for females are not worthy of life. But Jesus answers, I'll help her transform into a man so that she too can become a living spirit that resembles you men. Because every female who assumes a male identity is welcome in the kingdom of heaven. The good news is that Mary's right to enter the heavenly kingdom is protected by Jesus. The bad news is that she must first transform into a man. This last statement has been interpreted in a variety of ways by academics, from being obviously misogynistic to being metaphorical. The latter asserts that a female is related to humanity while a male implies divinity. The former reflects the patriarchal bias of its time. Gnostics believe that everyone is initially female or human, and that everyone then aspires to be male or divine. Even if this were true of Gnostic thought, it would have been preferable if they had made the point using language that was gender neutral. Some scholars attempt to interpret it in light of verse 22, which states that you will enter the kingdom when you make male and female into a single one, so that the male will not be male nor the female be female. It seems from this saying that all sexuality must be conquered. However, since external displays of piety like fasting, prayer, almsgiving, dietary observance, and circumcision are discouraged, one shouldn't assume that this is an ascetic document. However, it is abundantly clear from the Gospel of Thomas that Jesus came to earth as a human to instruct people on how to alter their way of life. He served as a conduit for the revelation of these secrets to the deserving, empowering them to emulate him. Despite our best efforts, scholars agree that reading and reflecting on each saying is the only way to truly comprehend it. As one discovers their own light, they will start to shine that light for others. This is a gospel of insight, not a gospel of works righteousness versus grace. Thank you for your support.